Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And good morning to everybody. I'd like to start by thanking the, um, the Coordination Committee for actually inviting me to give this presentation. And what is a relatively new and uh, quite disruptive um, capability um, called Integrated Vehicle Health Management. Um, thank you. Um, coincidentally, the centre has been around for about five years. It started from New in Cranfield five years ago, almost to the day. It was started by Boeing and a number of aerospace partners. And we still stay with those partners, but we have actually branched out into some different fields, meanwhile, in the last couple of years, uh, energy, medicine, and even agriculture. And I'll touch on those a little bit later as we go through the slides. The um, running order for today is really to answer some questions for you. I want to start off with, you know, well, what is it? What is IVHM? So I'll, take, I'll tell you about some definitions and some taxonomy. Um, well, what can it do for us? What, what actually do we need to do? How, how do? Why do we justify it? And so I'll present the case for IVHM, and I'll do that in three different ways. Uh, we're constantly being asked for business cases from industry to justify the use of this technology on advanced platforms. And then the third question I'll try and ask is, well, what sort of progress has been made? What have you actually done for us recently? I'll do that with one case from industry, but mostly from the center itself, and then just finishing some concluding remarks. So starting off with the de definition... IVHM is actually a capability that en enables the, pro the provision of OEMs to move from products to actually service provision. And it's the transformation, as it says here, of systems data taken from sensors placed on vehicles um, into information that supports operational decisions, basically on maintenance. And what we're trying to do overall is move unscheduled maintenance events into scheduled maintenance events to, to, to actually prevent failure in service and hence create real business benefit. And this is something that will probably come over in my talk, the relationship between the technology and the business benefit. And this is really why this, this sort of capability is, is deemed to be disruptive. To put it on a, on a different picture, let's, let's picture the aftermarket. Let's picture this actually in service. On the right-hand side of this, of, the, of this picture is what I deem to be IVHM, the Sense, Acquire, Transfer, Analyze, Act loop. You place sensors on these high-value assets, whether they be aeroplanes, whether it be wind turbines or submarines. You place these sensors fairly frugally because the information and the data that comes from them can, eat, can overload the system that comes after it quite quickly. You acquire the data locally to that, to that asset, transfer the data to some operational analysis unit, which pr actually processes the data as automatically as possible, and then by default, by looking at the degraded components, relays that back to a management or operational control system. And that control system can actually then act upon that data, given the information from the bottom left-hand corner on maintenance and logistics, what's happening in the supply chain, what's happening in my overhaul basis, when can we fit this, this maintenance in. Design is mentioned at the top left-hand corner of this, not, not to rectify things that you see as infantile mortalities in some of these, but more to address the next generation of product because the best database from which to design your next, next product is actually the bottom right-hand corner, because there you have your best practice, your lessons learned, what went well and what, what didn't go quite so well. So that's the picture for IVHM. And to put it yet another way, we developed this taxonomy almost at the beginning of the center. Quite remarkably, it hasn't changed very much at all. It's another way of explaining this. So to go from left to right, we deal with the impetus on the left, moving through the creation phase, which actually the creation of the business case and the systems design, which is where most of the work we've been doing is, through to technologies and to support, to support the operation centers that you see there. So the impetus for all of this work is really the move to service offerings by a good deal of large businesses, businesses like Rolls-Royce, businesses like Boeing. Um, because if you look at a product industry, and if you actually want to instrument your product so that it can be maintained, why on earth would you do that? Because you throw away the aftermarket. You throw away the money that you might be actually making from maintenance and repair. It's only when you move to a service offering that this makes any sense at all. The creation phase is really, as I said, where we've spent a lot of time in this. What is the business case and what are the business models that we're actually generating by using this sort of technology? How do we design these systems? You could say in, in the end they're really control systems because they involve hardware and software and communication. But they're actually more sophisticated than that. And then architectures. How do you actually compare two architectures together? Um, we have this saying, in, in, well, this, the saying really came from America. It's called cyber-physical systems. 
It's that you want to enact something, and you can actually change both the hardware and the software in such a way as to achieve what you want. But this, this is involved two boxes, three boxes. Are you using the CMC on board? Are you using processing that actually exists? And then the technologies and the support. The other thing we do at the center is we actually have some demonstrators, and they're small-scale demonstrators shown up there. The reason for this is if you don't fund fundamentally understand the physics on a test bench and can produce the diagnostics that come from the signal processing, etc., you really can't do it on a full-scale machine. But once you understand those fundamental physics, actually moving it into the real world and dealing with the noise and the environment that you encounter there is still quite a challenge, but the fundamental physics remains the same. And the sector demos that I put up there, we've got into different sectors, as I was saying before, with energy and agriculture, etc., and we demonstrate those. So with that behind us, with the idea that that's IVA gem, how do we make the case for it? What is it that we're trying to do, and what is it we're trying to satisfy? And this actually comes in three different ways. Uh, we're going to address safety, operational efficiency, and economic. And in doing this, I'll touch on some of the Indian counterparts to some of these things as we move forward. So firstly, safety. This is a rather complicated table taken from a report from 2010. Uh, it covers five years, 1998 to 2003. I'm not quite so sure why the data is so, so far behind the report, but never mind. Um, and this deals with system component and failure malfunctions. Um, rather a complicated phrase, but those are actually malfunctions that can be addressed by IVHM. Um, in this table, there's three columns, and what I want to look at is the first column, the Part 121 column, the major airlines and the cargo carriers. Those are the major, the major civil airlines that fly around the world. And there's two types of event in here. There's accident and incident. An accident is, is where uh, human life is affected, or there's been major hull loss. An incident is where there could have been major accident, and, uh, there could have been fatalities or hull loss. And if I just highlight three figures here, the total number of flying hours for these, for the, in, in civil aviation over this period was 232 million flying hours in five years. Now, if I had done my sums correctly, and for some of the students at the back, you can get out your calculators, I reckon that is 5,000 aircraft in the, in the air, 24-7, 365 for every day of the five years. Now, I know the world's a very big place, but 5,000 aircraft is a lot of aircraft. So 5,000 aircraft in the air all the time. You may say the total number of accidents is actually quite low. Well, um, we're always being challenged on safety, and I'll, I'll show you some figures which actually reduce this even further. But what I do want to pinpoint here is the fatalities in accidents with SCM is 36%. So actually 36% of the fatalities here could have been avoided if IVHM had been used. And also the incidence with SCM is 66%. So IVHM can have a very real impact on the safety picture. You do, when you look into the safety picture, actually come up with some rather bizarre incidents. I mean, how you actually get this, this, this thing in the cell of a, of a delta, I don't know. But the one I like is in the middle of this, which is this bird um, that is actually in the wing of a T-45 trainer. Now, this is its leg. So you might actually imagine how big the bird is. But these are the sort of things that happen when things go wrong. Moving on to operational, I want to look at some aerospace growth figures and a little bit about growth in India. So firstly, this is a slide for each of these yellow dots. This is a civil airliner flying around the world. And as we look at this, nighttime is going from um, right to left across the screen. You can see that Europe has actually calmed down. America's um, quite got quite a lot of activity in it here, which is dying down as nighttime comes. As daytime comes to Europe, it picks up. The Pacific Rim has picked up. India's got a little bit of traffic in it. These are the sort of crowded skies we're talking about. And so one of the things that comes out of this is our traffic management, let alone our operation itself. Um, the, the, the ATM system across Europe um, is really being pushed, and there are a lot, of, a lot of research challenges involved in how to keep up with that. This is quite an impressive picture not so much happening in um, South Africa and South America, and little bits happening in Australia from time to time. But these very crowded congestions of um, really over Europe and the US. <coughs> I should stop soon. Right. <coughs> Um, right, so with that as the background, um, a couple of figures, some figures for you. 
And these were, the first ones were Airbus figures and they're from Aerotech 2011. Um, Airbus were predicting a 4.8% growth in civil aerospace over the next 20 years. Now, nearly 5% growth over 20 years, I'd like to be in that business. That's a good business to be in. What were the effects of 9-11 then? Well, in 9-11, the year after in 2002, Rolls-Royce, Rolls-Royce alone in aircraft engines lost $1 billion worth of sales. Those were, that's for sales that were cancelled that were not actually in the 2002 order book. So that's a 1,000 aircraft overcapacity. In 2012, last year, it was expected to be a 1,000 aircraft undercapacity. So this is a very buoyant market, you know, the, 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 civil, um, the civil arena. People want to fly. The traffic is continuing. It's going to con- continue at quite a, quite a rate. Now, let's consider some of the challenges. Akari have published the Flight Path 2050. This is for Europe. These are challenges. We're working on the 2020, but almost in terms of the technology, we're almost there for 2020. But look at this for a figure. 90% of travelers in Europe anywhere door-to-door within four hours. Sometimes I can spend almost four hours getting to the airport, and I live about about an hour away. So this implies interconnectivity of travel systems, but it also implies things like security systems at airports, the ATM you just looked at, looked at. Delays and cancellations mean that they really can't happen in, the, in these sort of timescales. The pilot gets into the plane, turns the key. The plane has to start, or you have to know exactly what line replaceable unit to replace. Um, less than one accident per 10 million flights. Relating back to the safety case I showed before, that is one-third of the accident rate at the moment. So we're going to go to much more crowded skies, 5% growth in traffic, etc. But we're going to go to a third of the accident rate. And as I said about our traffic management, I think these sort of figures are absolutely unattainable without IVHM, without knowing how the asset is behaving in, 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 a, in a day-to-day situation and knowing what, partners, what, what parts of the aircraft to replace. Just a reflection on the growth of India. Um, whether it's uh, NCAD, whether it's RTA, whatever the civil airliner is that India decides to go forward in, there was a meeting here last year in Bangalore, and really this is what I wanted to point out. Um, it was, it was, a, it was a, a workshop. It was a, between the U.S. And, and Indian counterparts. A very, very strong theme on IVHM and safety. And I think the conclusion of all of those present, but they were in the field, was that IVHM would be an integral part of any commercial offering in the future. Just a note on operational service, <coughs> operational service offerings. Um, number of offerings on there. Uh, the three in blue I've shown are, actually, are really engine manufacturers. And so I've taken them out of the picture. I'll actually talk a little bit about the G650 in a minute. Um, but what I want to do is just show the sort of unscheduled versus scheduled maintenance approach that operators are going with. The traditional unscheduled maintenance action that occurs actually far too much today and that you might not think from all the, all the prestigious papers that are presented actually does happen. As an aircraft lands on the ground, And you download the CMC, the maintenance guy goes on board, finds there's a fault. That fault is then diagnosed, you plan the maintenance, you find you don't have the parts, you have to wait around, and then maintenance action is taken. That is all unscheduled maintenance, and that's that first row across there. Uh, What Umbrella have done with a head, and this is where most, um, quite a lot of OEMs are going, is, is maintenance with fault forwarding, where actually you can actually forward that fault to the ground, the diagnosis can hopefully be made, and the maintenance planning can be done before the aircraft touches down. Now, this is not to say that you actually completely mitigate that unscheduled maintenance. You don't. You still have that red block to deal with. Where we want to get to, and this is really a nirvana, is we want to get to prognostics, being able to forecast into the future. So when we get that health warning on the ground, when we do the diagnostics, how long have we got before we make a decision about the maintenance? And can we actually pull that maintenance in when the aircraft's on the ground that isn't disrupting the operation? And can we turn that into scheduled maintenance? The thing about prognostics is it's always based on knowing what the usage is going forwards. And sometimes the usage going forwards isn't quite what you plan it to be, as shown by these two cases. Um, I'm not going to touch on prognostics in this talk, but it's an extremely interesting and a reasonably difficult subject for IVHM moving forward. And finally, on an economic, how do you actually put an efficient business together? Just let's assume that we have a two-hour flight. What has been happening in the recent past is in order to actually match their KPIs, the key performance indicators, a lot of airlines have been adding extra time onto their flights. You may have noticed this. You actually look at the time it takes for the flight. I think that's far too long. 
And what actually they're trying to do is they're trying to get pushback from the gate time or actually delivery time to the, to the far end. So they do that by putting in this contingency. The only problem is this contingency actually mounts up. And so maybe you can get three flights a day. The problem is, in the same length of time, you would have got four flights a day had you taken out the contingency. But the contingency means that you actually must not have any delays and cancellations on those flights. So a flight's got to come in, and if it's got a problem with it, you've got to know exactly which line replaceable unit to change and when and where to change it. In doing that, you might not think this is a big, big problem, but actually this problem alone cost Delta $385 million in 2011. So having said that, let me move on to progress in IVHM. I want to pick out one case from industry, and then I'll move to what we've been doing at the centre. Um, I would point out that um, the, the committee actually asked me to write a technical paper for this, so there is a technical paper in the journal. And there, I go through three different technologies, each of which I could spend the 20-minute presentation on going through. One of them is actually on business cases, and it uses a, a scenario using intelligent agents to actually map um, a warrior tank case one is on rotating machines and how to, how to look at imbalance and misalignment of shafts. The other one is on acoustic emission, um, potentially a, um, a, a challenging concept for um, the, the, the fiber optics that you saw before. But I won't go through those. And they, In fact, if you look at the paper, I've actually put another four or five different um, technologies we've been involved in in the five years we've been around. But what I want to do here is take a rather high-level view of it all. But I'd be happy to discuss any, um, any of the technology that we have had in, in some detail. What I do want to do, I just want to start off with a comment on Gulfstream. Because I do believe that Gulfstream in the civil aerospace arena are the first people to equip a plane with IVHM. They call it Aircraft Health and Trend Monitoring System, AHTMS. Um, Gulfstream have the G450 and G550. They have about 600 planes in operation. And what they do there is that on board, <coughs> they have the usual digital flight data recorder, and the cockpit voice recorder. And those are a reasonable source of data, but not very rich data. But it isn't actually matched up to the ground, <clears throat> where you have the maintenance and the operation. So, that, so the plane still lands, and you sort it out very much with the unscheduled maintenance that I went through before. What they've done with the G650 is from the time they started to design it. And the G650 was designed and flight trialed between 2008 and 2012, so it went into service last year. In that period of time, they designed an IVHM system that ran alongside all the other systems on board. Um, it, really, it really monitors virtually everything on the plane, um, because what they're actually trying to do is to learn what these characteristics of the plane system look like in, in real time. So it has onboard acquisition and processing. It has communication management. It communicates with the ground in a number of different ways. It has the ability to use SATCOMs to communicate when things are really critical and they want to turn around the plane at the far end so you can actually dispatch a part way ahead of a plane doing, a, let's say, a transatlantic trip. Um, it uses ACARs, which is the normal line-of-sight VHF type of communication, but also on the ground it uses either Wi-Fi or GMS mobile phone to communicate what are tens of megabytes of data off each flight every time it lands. So in all of that, what it's doing is collecting a rich pattern of data, and it's been going for about a year now. Um, but it is, I think, um, a, a good example of where I think things will be going in the future. Right, to change tracks here, I want to really finish off by talking about the centre and the sort of areas that we've been in. Um, and these are the sort of project areas that we deal with at the moment. We are basically an aerospace centre, and I, pro I think probably will remain so. But we have done some other, interesting, some other really interesting areas. Um, up at the top here, this is a process flow industry. This is with Procter & Gamble on, on, on powder metallurgy. Um, this is wind turbines, and as we move around, we see rail that we've just had a contract with. Um, the one in the center, this one here, is an 11 kilovolt network, which we've just started modeling. So this is electricity supply at the lowest level to the local substations. What we're going to do there is that once we've modeled it, we're going to see where the weaknesses in the system are, and then move on to actually start health monitoring that system. A recent European contract is just to, the right, just, just, just to the right of that. And this is in additive manufacturing. So if the IVHM is actually saying that you need to repair this part, and you're going to repair the part, this is a blade, this is the tip of a, um, a, a turbine blade. Um, if you're going to repair that part, then how do you do that? And then how do you put it back into service? And how do you monitor it in the future? But perhaps the most interesting one of, one of these, in the, in the sense of it's so different, what, what we might have been talking about, is the agriculture one that's actually up here. We've been working with Embrapa in Brazil, 
And what we've actually been looking at is the enterprise farm. So what happens in sugarcane uh, harvesting, for example, is that you have combine harvesters. And by the way, fields in Brazil are huge. They're measured by how, how long it takes a light aircraft to fly across them. So you can have a two-hour by one-hour field, so to speak. It's not unusual for combine harvesters to go across 25 abreast. So what we're talking about here with, with this sort of network-enabled farm is when you go out and cook, and, and cook sugar cane, is, um, sorry, that totally put me off. <laughs> when, when you go out and cut, cut sugar cane, the time to actually the processing, the process factory is absolutely critical. So what you can do is you can GPS enable both the cutters, both the trucks, and actually then schedule them to come back to the farm so you're actually, recoup you're actually making the best use of the sugar cane that you're actually cutting. I bet when you came here today to a seminar on aerospace that you didn't think you'd be being taught anything about sugarcane farming in Brazil. But anyway, that's an example. Um, some other training and education um, and publications that we've made. We run an IVHM short course each year. The next one's in March. Um, we started an MSC in IVHM, the first in the world. But the two books that I've edited down in the bottom right-hand corner are now in our third with SAE. Uh, and SAE has taken a really large interest in IVHM. Uh, we have an IVHM steering group. And we have a technical group which is starting to produce documents. So we're starting to think of standards in terms of IVHM rather than in terms of the, the, the systems themselves. Um, these are the sort of areas that I've actually dealt with over the, over the years in the center. The interesting thing about this is that I actually drew the background taxonomy before we did the projects. So it just happens that we actually addressed the sort of areas that I thought we would to begin with. I just wanted to touch on one specific project. Um, and, and this is to do with um, developing health, health management development process. And so what you see here in the, in the inner circle is design, instrument, produce, service, maintain. The typical design cycle, if you like. And what we're taking here as a, as a target function is actually a fuel rig. It's a small fuel rig we have at the center. The physical simulator we're using the design is Simulation X. But what we were struggling with for quite a while is where you place your sensors, how you know where the problems are, how you get uh, no ambiguity groups. Do, is it this problem or is it this problem? And we've used some software out of Australia from PHM Technology called MADE to the functional analysis, which gives you the sense of placement, but it also gives you the diagnostic rules that are used across here once you've produced the data. So as you move around this, you do the functional analysis with the physical simulator and with the fuel rig. You produce the sensors, you produce the rig, you run it, you get operational results, and then you embed the diagnostic rules in this engine so that when you take the signals from the rig, you can actually diagnose what went wrong. But it's actually this triangle that is so strong and that we've built over the years. And from this triangle, we can do a lot of different things. We realized we could do so many different things, but in talking with now, particularly after the workshop last year, we've now got into a relationship where we're actually going to do things together. And now we're totally reproducing the fuel rig over here. And we'll be working together on some of these interesting areas in the future. I won't bother with that. I'll just move on to concluding remarks. So what I think I've done in this is I've made the case for, well, I, I suppose I've told you a little bit about what IVHM is to start with. I've made the case for IVHM in three different ways, in safety, operational, and economic. Prognostics I could talk about for a long time, because I think particularly with, with prognostics, I think you return to the design systems, the way you design things, and you start looking at high-fidelity simulations, whether it's CFD for the aerodynamics or fluid flow, whether it's stress analysis or thermal analysis. And I think that will be a rich, a rich area for the future. I've detailed some of the progress in IVHM, and I take my hat off to Gulfstream for, I think, being the first there. Um, this is in the civil sector, of course, the JSF excluded. And I've, I've illustrated some of the capability of IV, the IVHM Center, and I would encourage you to actually go to, um, to the paper and look at some of those references if you want more technical details for that. But I think the real next paradigm shift is to actually use health management in design. So what will happen is you'll be, maybe be designing a component and you'll have three different ways of doing it. One of them will be monitorable. You'll know how it's failing. You can, you can monitor it. And I think that's the one that will be chosen for the future. You'll be able to reduce, safe, you'll be able to reduce the levels of over-design that you've got in those. And coincidentally, with NAL and CMTI, we've just put a proposal in joint together um, on such a topic. Thank you for your attention, and I'd be quite willing to take any questions. Uh, friends, I think a few questions now. That's nice. I think you are part, you are 
aware that I am running out of time. <coughs> uh, I think Professor's talk is very relevant in the Indian environment as well. The increasing cost of the products and the pressure to utilize, effectively utilize the assets we have, the uh, health monitoring system, internet health monitoring system becomes relevant. I think the research effort, I probably mean some of you are aware, has been initiated and HL and ADA is already doing. Plus NIL, same day, I see some more efforts are going on. A partnership role, as suggested by Professor, I think will bring in a system which can be used for our platforms much faster and better, in, at least in the futuristic platforms like AMCA, UCAV, which is already on the drawing board. I think we need to integrate this system in the drawing board level itself so that we have an effective system. Data gathering happens during prototype testing, which can, can be used for validating. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you.